for half a century, WJPZ Syracuse has been the greatest media classroom on the planet. We've trained students from the 1970s to the 2020s on how to run a professional radio station. But the lessons learned and relationships formed go far beyond studios and transmitters. Taking a look back through the eyes of those who experienced it. This is WJPZ at 50. Welcome to WJPZ at 50. I am John Jagge. Quick programming update before we get started today. Yes, the official regular release schedule of the podcast has concluded But I have said for anybody that wants to reach out and still wants to come on the podcast, I'm happy to do one-offs whenever they may pop up. I had a couple people approach me uh, at this year's banquet in Syracuse, asked about coming on the pod, so we may have them. Uh, And today's guest actually sent me a note after the weekend saying he didn't get a chance to talk to me in person, but wanted to come on the show. He has a bit of an unusual story, so we're going to get to it. Matthew Reschke, a.k.a. Our Source. For introduction purposes, we'll say class of 12, but we'll get into this a little bit more. Welcome to the podcast. Happy to be here. It's uh, an honor. And anything with WJPZ uh, attached to it is always awesome in my mind. Now, you grew up in Syracuse? So I grew up in a suburb of Syracuse, about 30 minutes away from campus, a town called Chittenango. Yep. So I I know about Z. My first memory of Z is actually talking to a guy named Spike. He was on AOL. (laughs) <laughs> I don't think it was AIM. I think it was AOL. And I thought I was like the coolest guy because I had this contact and I was talking to a live DJ that was on air. So this would have um, been, gosh, this would have been probably like 98, 99-ish? I would say so. Yeah, that's my furthest memory. Now, where I lived at the time, Z didn't come in everywhere in CNY. I, I was going to ask that. Okay, because that's pretty far east. Okay. I remember, though, in the car, you wouldn't always get it, but I just... My first memory was with Spike talking to him online and knowing the DJs, being like, I know this guy, I'd tell a few people. And I kept it secret, too, because I'm like, oh, I know a, a celebrity. So that was my first memory of Z. Oh, back when they thought Yammer. radio DJs were celebrities back uh, around my undergrad days. Yeah, they definitely did. So you were familiar with the station. It was this sort of entity that you could pick up here and there growing up. Then you eventually kind of head to Syracuse, right? I did an undergrad at Onondaga Community College, Mm -hmm. transferred to Lemoyne, got my bachelor's in around 05. So then what brought me to Z is I was a part-time student around 2008, taking some non-matric courses, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And I found one of the informational packets where they were advertising the station. And I remember this like it was yesterday. They had the information session. Mina was a big speaker at that. Oh, yeah. Recruiting kids. Sean Scott, DJS1. I think he was just like on his way out. So the transition period. And I remember Alex Silverman there. Those three people really stood out that that time. And I filled out the information they wanted. I was like, thinking, oh, they're never going to accept some guy that that (laughs) found this. But they did. And if I could reverse real quick, Mm -hmm. the first like radio experience I ever had was I was an undergrad at LeMoyne and they had a college radio station called WLMU, cheap plug to them. But (laughs) it was what the norm that people think of a college radio, kids fooling around. Yeah. We were doing whatever we wanted. We party. They streamed on the campus TV system, which I think WJPZ, at least for a few years when I was there, they had the cameras and would broadcast the zoo live or whatever. So they did that. So that was my introduction in 03, 05-ish time frame, and I dabbled in that. So yeah, I had some experience. I came there. I signed up. I know that if I don't mention this guy, we'll make sure it gets mentioned, but Darren Benda, when we went through training, I'll say it now, publicly live for the first time. He <laughs> trained me at Z. Okay. I sat with him and the shadowing, the few weeks. We went over the board. He was really cool. He definitely deserves his recognition there. I went through the training with him, was doing the shifts whenever I could get in. And then the first thing I remember doing was I signed up for a Z Morning Zoo at the time. I was paired with a gentleman named Jaquel Brown, called him Q. I forget exactly how we got paired up, but we got paired up. And one thing that's funny is, as I mentioned to you, I lived outside of Syracuse, so it was about 30 minutes from the hill. Okay. So at 5 a.m., my dad, he worked a job. So him and I would drive together. I'd take my car, 
he'd take his because he was going to work and I would have to go to work or be up at the university after uh, the show. So we'd leave at five. I'd pick up Q at South Campus, mm. drop my car. I, I used to shuttle to Manly. My dad would drop us off in front of Watson Hall, get us in. I talked to Alex Silverman this weekend and thanked him. I go, you really deserve going in the Hall of Fame. I remember all those mornings we had card access errors and you'd come down from wherever he lived, I think South Campus, and he'd let us in. Let me timestamp this for a second because you mentioned Alex and everything. So you're doing the morning show. It's during the academic year. What year is this that, that you're in there with Q? It had to have been late 2008 or 2009. So I don't have all the years exact. No, that's fine. But I'm, I'm glad we're talking after banquet because it gives us a chance to recognize two of our newest Hall of Famers who worked brilliantly together. And that, of course, being Alex Silverman and Mina Yona. And it's great to know that you learned from two of the best uh, when you got there. I, I got to say that. And it was really important that I was in the room with them. I got a chance to briefly speak with both of them. And I was so happy that they do the Hall of Fame separate from the banquet now because to me, it really honors both of them. Kid Kelly, Dion especially introduced me and all of it's true. I've never told her this, but she's just had this welcoming personality that Mm -hmm. I remember sitting as a student, an older student in the back of that theater. And she was just like, like a motherly figure, ironically, because <laughs> she's got a little one just like I do now, yep. gathering everyone like pep rally. And I was like, I knew in that room, I don't know what I'm going to do here if they're even going to let me talk into the microphone, but I want to at least learn from these people. And then Alex, I don't have to give a background on him. Look <laughs> at his accomplishments. My biggest memory of Alex Silverman is not actually Z. I listened to him during the hurricane that hit New York City. And he was like out live broadcasting for CBS radio, I believe, yep. at the time. And I picked him up and I was following Twitter. Twitter was really big then. And yeah. I remember Matt Friedman, another JP's ear, had also tweeted out. And I was already following Radio Gold right now and talking about the importance of radio as Alex Silverman. I think it was Hurricane Sandy. Sandy? Yep. Yeah. That's my I mean, mom's name. So I remember that one. <laughs> yeah. It was gold. He just painted a picture, and I'm just sitting there in awe the whole time, like, this is history happening in front of our eyes. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so let's go back to your story, Matt. So you are at Z, you're doing the morning show. What else did you get involved with while you were there? So I did the morning show. I I dabbled with a few other people. Joni, I know some people know Joni. We did a few shows, one off. So obviously I was a, a local, which I don't always like to be referred to, but an opportunity came up to program in the summer, and I cannot remember what we used for the life of me, but Lauren Levine was the program director or one of the roles, and they needed people to program the station for seven days a week. So I took one of the days and I learned, came in once a week, and I programmed that day out. And um, it was just eye opening learning how a radio station's programmed the back end of this. You don't just have a log of songs yeah. and just throw them in. I cannot remember the program for the life of me, but you have the ABC songs and oh yeah, selector. You know, selector. Thanks, Jag. Yep. I have no idea if they still use that. I'd love to just look at the interface. I can tell you right now from talking to the more recent grads. So they had the original DOS based selector that many of us use in radio, and then they've since separated the G selector, which is the newer Windows based version for anybody who's who scheduled music, who's listening, who's curious what they're up to in 2024. I think I use both, but I'd probably have to see them to get the memory jogged. But it was a really cool experience. Don't get me wrong. There was days it was like tedious. I'm like, I don't know how someone does this for seven (laughs) days a week, but it was really an awesome experience. Okay. So how did the nickname R Source come into play? So probably a little before my days at WLMU, I love to get new music. Back in the day, mixtapes were a thing and we had a core group of friends and we, we were like R Source for music. We wanted to put on shows and DJ and just like fun events up there. So I needed a name. I I thought Matt was real basic for (laughs) a show. So everybody had nicknames and that's how it started. And it was like this music movement that we had. Now, in college, I guess everybody has some dreams. I was the one who stuck with it. And um, I carried it over to Z. Just because, like I said, I thought Matt 
everybody's Matt. How am I going to stand out? I think on the zoo, I was Matt and our source. It's funny. I remember Q. I don't think he ever, I think he always said outsource instead of our source. <laughs> and I looked at him one day and I'm like, it's our source, man. I didn't say it out loud to him. I think I corrected him off air, but I was like, you know what? I just went with it because maybe it could be a, a like a show bit where we somebody calls in and we go over it. So that that was the beginning of it. One thing I left out is my furthest memory of radio is my sister and I used to use the boom box and we'd record our own radio shows and we do our own talk breaks. I never dreamed of doing this, but we used to do like playtime as children and we hosted our own radio show back then. And that <laughs> I've joked in previous episodes of the podcast that I have a tote board that I put a mark on for anybody who says they've got to Syracuse and wanted to be a sportscaster. I think I should have a second tote board for anybody who played with any of those, whether it was Fisher Price or a slightly Radio Shack or higher end taping the radio, talking over the intros, the songs, want to be DJ as a kid. I feel like that's a, a tie that binds so many of us uh, in this group. Yeah. I wanted to be a garbage man, Jag. What? When I was a kid. I wanted to be a garbage man. I wanted to ride on the back of a garbage truck, pull the lever and crush the garbage. That was what I, what I wanted to be as a kid. I did do the, the radio thing for fun, but never was like, I'm going to do this someday. <laughs> I would hate to think that radio got in the way of your dreams of being a sanitation <laughs> worker. No, I don't. I don't know where that stopped. That dream stopped. I guess those surveys you do in middle school, high school of what do you do want, want to do with your career. The garbage man never came up there. So I guess that was the stop to that. But as I was a child, that's what I wanted to do. It's WJPZ. At 50. Hey, it's Jag. You're probably listening to this episode of the podcast because you know the person I'm interviewing. But one of the true joys of this project has been learning the stories of everyone in the WJPZ family. When you're done with this podcast, I'd encourage you to check out an episode with someone you don't know. You never know what you might have in common with your other WJPZ relatives. Looking back at half a century of broadcast excellence. This is WJPZ at 50. One thing I know you wanted to cover at Z was the show that you started. I proposed a mix show. It was called Off the Hook. I played some local music with a twist of hip hop that wasn't being broadcast anywhere in Syracuse. You couldn't find this. We yeah. didn't have a hip hop station. The hip hop station, we had been gone a, a while. And I blended like top 40-ish hip hop songs, but you weren't hearing them on Hot or Q or Z. Some you were, but very few. And then rhythmic hip hop with local, and it was just, it was called Off the Hook. I proposed that. They accepted. It became my claim to fame. One thing, Jordan Hayes mentions this. I came up with a segment called Bump It or Dump It. I'd play a song that I knew this is only going to be me playing this, <laughs> and I let the fans decide, bump it or dump it. If they bumped it, if they called in and voted to bump it, I'd continue it on the show. If they dumped it, I never played that song again. And there was some, I think, at some times. Not usually, but there'd be some. Otherwise, I'd be like, this one's getting bumped. And so I think he's done a tribute to me. So I thank him a lot when he's been back to Z. I know he has his own little station that he runs and podcast thing. And he's done that as a tribute. And, and I'm honored that someone would do that. I, I don't think I invented it. I didn't steal it from someone. But the idea, I don't know, one day I ran that on, on the zoo. And that was like the segment on my mix show. Every year I remembered on the mix show doing a countdown. And I actually tallied phone requests. And I think some social media, but definitely the phone requests. And they were legitimate tallies. At the end of the year, I'd play like the top. 10 most requested songs. That's impressive um, that you actually tracked it as opposed to just I, fudging it I, like a lot of people in radio have historically I, done. I did, Jag. I don't know if I had the paper and electronic copies still in the archive, but I did that because I really took pride in being authentic with that show. I took a ton of pride in that. It was there a lot of Sundays alone. The sports guys were always in and out. I'd always tell them, if you're available and you want to do your sports update, come in to the show. I knew so many sports guys from that. Other than that, the, the station was usually a ghost town on Sundays. 
I came in after a guy did the island ride. I think he was like a community member. I cannot remember his name. He did this really cool mix show island ride. And for a semester or two semesters, he'd have the audience already ready. And I'd come in and... You had a great lead in. What time was your show, Matt? So it was like 7 to 9 and 8 to 10. Mm -hmm. It depended on the semester and, and the time blocks. But I'll tell you, the time slot of that Sunday night, I was always like, are people going to care about this? I'll tell you, it had more success in my mind, more participation. The summer of 13, I brought the show back and ran it on like a Tuesday or Wednesday night when the new studio was implemented. And I didn't feel it had the engagement that was once there. Now, we took a break because I didn't participate when the station did all pre-recorded. And I love the live aspect on so many levels. So I'm going to tell a quick personal story here. At Banquet this year, I got a chance to go on the air and I love doing it. And I, it was just like 15, 20 minutes. I did a quick shift on the air and posted some videos to Facebook. And one of my close friends from my radio career, Joe Rosati, texted me and said, dude, you light up still to this day when you're behind a microphone. So to your point, Matt, there is something about being live. And I know the station... It wasn't the same when it had to rebuild the studios and it was pre-recorded at a new house and it was a necessary evil to end up with the amazing facilities that they have now and, and since then. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. There's something about live and I want to come back to what you said about creating the show. That's the beauty of Z. You can create something that some corporate behemoth owned radio station isn't going to have some senior vice president to prove. That's the beauty of Z is you can try things, you can do things and you prove it with that show. I've got to say, Rashad Thomas, I don't know if he, if it was Matt D'Angelo, I'm yeah, Antonio. his last name, yes, or Rashad that approved that, but Rashad Thomas was just a resource. You asked about Times at Z, and I, looking back all these years later, I didn't take advantage of the wealth of knowledge, the talent that that individual had. Rashad, without him, I would have never been able to have a success with that show. And it's one thing I pride myself on. I look back and I wish, but I produced it. I answered the phone. I did the best I could DJing with the tools at hand. It was hard sometimes to do everything I wanted, but those were two hours that I had this creative control that I'll carry for the rest of my life. So many amazing names in the history of JPZ, some we know and some we were learning for the first time today that you you worked with and you probably learned from. Any specific lessons that come to mind, life lessons, career lessons you felt like you learned at the station, Matt? I feel like this is going to come across cliche. Everybody throws this tagline in. But for a guy that didn't know what he really wanted to do with his career at Z, I remember the first banquet talking to people like Dave Goreb and how welcoming everyone was. And it was just family. Literally, you say JPZ. I got goosebumps. You probably can't see them on the video. Like just mention it because... Everybody cares about the success of others. It doesn't matter if you know this person for five minutes, but once you get to know them, you just, there's this connection that can't really be explained and everyone really cares about each other. You don't have to like beg or ask. It's just, hey, Jag, you like podcasts. Let's talk about that. And you're very welcoming. So the point of the long winded story is the network and the just, it taught me to like, personally build my resume and find my goals. Because during this time, I was I was trying to break into a field of IT, informational technology. Yeah. The job market in CNY was flooded. It's 180 degrees different than today. You'd apply, you'd be going up against 75 candidates. So what I'm saying there is you learn how to build your resume. It was better than any, and no offense to the people that have helped me over the years, career service advisor. It just taught you how to like, hey, Jag, I'm applying for this job. Like it put all that together. Yeah. Rocket Larry Ross, if I have any advice, like professionally, I could just message that guy because he's not working in the industry either. But we've built that relationship in 12 years of going to banquet and getting to know each other and loving SU sports. Just ask him for advice. And that's what JPZ is to me. It's this huge network of unlimited resources. Like you mentioned before, you're constantly learning about new people, what they've done, new names. I love going to the, not in the networking, but the student. Oh, the um, Friday conference. The Friday conferences. 
you shouted out Jay, a guy that I'd never met with some statistics on podcasting and radio. And I met Jay and got to know him. And we had a great conversation in 10, 15 minutes. And you make a new friend, like a lifelong friend. And Jay Nicholas is somebody that I've met working in podcasting at industry conferences, and I've really gotten to know him well. And we share some commonalities in that he worked in Detroit radio and I worked in Detroit radio. And he's somebody that I've only gotten to know the last few years, but have really gotten to enjoy knowing. It's a story that plays out between generations over and over again. Just the grad years and the names change, but the dynamic is still the same. Yeah, exactly. So Matt, you, you mentioned it. IT. Walk me through your career and what you've done since being at Z89. So since being at Z89, I've worked at IT at a few different companies in education, bounced between them. I've been like a help desk support tech, a desktop support technician, system admin. I'm not a full network administrator, but I do some network administration jobs. That was my goal of going to college and landing that. It didn't come quick, and it was a little harder than I ever would have anticipated. But that's that in a nutshell right there. And where are you working now? I'm at Onondaga Community College doing IT support for the entire college. So you've come full circle. Yeah, it's funny. I am full circle and we're having this conversation. I'm in an OCC room. That's one thing. I never did radio up at OCC. I couldn't even tell you the radio station name here. Just a few weeks ago, not to toot my own horn, an individual from the community, I know him through other things, came up to me at a, a live D1 basketball game up at Lemoyne, and he said, hey, what's good with the radio? I said, what do you mean? It, it's been uh, 12, yeah. 10, 12 years since I've been on live. But the fact that someone cared to still ask me about that, my point of this is to the students at Z, like you just said, there's so much time to learn, so many opportunities, take full advantage of them. The resources are everywhere alumni, the current students, live and learn. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Alex Silverman talks about plugging in those wires. I was afraid because <laughs> my buddy, Bill Drinkwater, was the technical guy at the time. And I'm like, I'll talk to Bill. I'm not touching any yeah, of this. Yeah. I don't want to I don't want to take the station offline. But looking back, it's if you tried to fix something and you would have told and communicated, no one's going to get mad. It really is what it said, this live media classroom that you can't, to an outsider, they can't fully comprehend, but it really is the greatest tool. I've worked in sandboxes, live labs, doing simulations. WJPZ blows away any of those opportunities that I've come across. And I've had some cool resources being a student up at SU and worked on real live cyber attacks as they're happening. I still think the stuff with Z, WJPZ is the best. The legacy's huge. Uh, the one thing I wanted to say that I did leave off is like Jordan Capozzi, that he worked for me while I was at Z. He bagged some groceries and we worked together. And he told me he was going to Newhouse. And I looked at him, I said, if you never listen to me at, at this job or take any advice I ever give, while you're up at SU, make sure you sign up for Z89. I go, I don't care what you do there. I really recommend you get on exec staff and do everything you can. He had told me he wanted to be like a sports guy, media guy. And Jordan Capozzi, I'm so proud of him. Yeah. He went to Z. He's known all over Syracuse and he's just a great talent. And I just wanted to give him a shout out. There's so many names. I cannot make a list. I don't even want to try right. because there's so many names that have impacted me at my time there and time after. But that, that's one story with Z I want to get out there that I'm so proud of knowing him and remembering him as a high school kid bagging groceries that went out there. I think that's a fantastic place to leave it. Matthew Reschke, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and approaching me uh, about coming on the podcast. And by the way, Rashad Thomas, if you're listening, you were mentioned earlier, uh, he's one of the people that approached me at Banquet. So Rashad, waiting on that email or that text from you so we can get you on the podcast as well. Matt, thanks so much for coming on. Jag, thanks so much for having me. It's a true honor with the legends of WJBZ, Z89, just to have a few minutes to talk to you. But I got to sign off one last time. You're listening to the Beat of Syracuse, Z89. You're off the hook with our source. Do not change that dial. 
The WJPZ at 50 podcast is created entirely by the staff and alumni of the world's greatest media classroom. It's hosted by John Jag Gay, class of 2002. Editing help from James Bames Grundy III, class of 2020. Imaging by Maureen Cooper, class of 1999. And Ed Lacombe, class of 1985. Podcast artwork by Marty Dundix, class of 2001. Follow WJPZ at 50 on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now.